Good morning, brothers and sisters. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance as we open his word on the Sabbath day? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with grateful hearts that we may enter into a Sabbath of rest. Help us now to learn further what it truly means to enter into a Sabbath of rest. Father, we thank you for these many opportunities we have to study at this time. We thank you also to be able to lift others up in prayer. I thank you for each one that are joining in this study this morning. I pray, Father, that we may be able to have an open discussion on all of the subjects that we will be addressing. We also, Father, lift up Elder Jeff and Sister Kathy. We thank you for this opportunity. We pray, Father, for your healing hand to be upon Sister Kathy. We also ask, Father, for relief for Elder Jeff in this situation. We know that he relies upon you. We know that he has been directed by you for this time. Help us now, Father. Direct us in all things that you would have us to do. Be with those that will listen to this later in recording. Show us, Father, that that you would have us to understand from these passages. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Now, before you, I have a very specific passage that we covered this last week. And there was something that struck me about this from our conversations. So as we read Judges 18.29, and they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born unto Israel, howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. What are we seeing here? We have, we have a group of Danites that have come up from the territory that was allotted to them. They did not wish to expend the effort to take that territory. So they go to take the territory of another of the tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. But they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father. What are they doing here? Claiming and renaming something that doesn't belong to them rightfully. Okay, so we have a name change, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. What is the implication of this name change? I mean, when we're looking at Abram to Abraham, when we are looking at Jacob to Israel, we have a party that is entering into a covenant. What can we say about this name change? Counterfeit covenant. Counterfeit of the covenant. Hmm. Would you agree with this or would you have other things to add? As we is look, there, go is ahead. there any significance about um, this city being about four miles from Caesarea Philippi or Paneum? There could be. So this was 
just within four miles of Caesarea Philippi, or as you said, of Paneum. Yeah. So what, since we know that Dan is translated as judge, mm -hmm. what is layish? Um, it's just been... It means um, uh, a lion from his destructive blows, or an old lion, a crushing sense of crushing. So we have an old lion here that is now translated, is now renamed Judge. Mm -hmm. But as we see in the in the following verse. And the children of Judge set up a graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Judge until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, would we agree that the, the day of the captivity of the land was well after the period of the judges? And if so, when would we, when we, we looked for this to be? Well, my view was that this isn't really referring to what we would call the captivity of the land at the time of Daniel. This is referring to something else. Okay. Right, so we talked about that a bit last time. Um. I guess I would I would look at this because the translators were giving reference to 1 Samuel 4, 2, and 3. Yeah, it's just that this book would have been written long before and completed long before the time of the captivity. So it can't be referring to, because um, it's referring to historical reference. Um, so... Trying to remember what I'd figured out last time. Um, yeah. What was the reference here? Um, that it should actually be the captivity of the ark. Okay, so we would be then talking about 1 Samuel 4, 2, and 3, and 1 yeah. Samuel 4, 10. Yeah, so not the captivity <clears throat> of the land. So we would be speaking of this portion that the children of Dan set up the graven image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day Eli died. Would that be fair? Yeah. Yeah, so this captivity of the land, I think that, I mean, they try to make an argument that, you know, it should be Ark there, but... But I think that it just is referring to the captivity of the ark, but they refer to the idea of the land um, for some reason. I'm trying to figure this out. But yeah, it's going to go to, to that period of time, to Samuel. So this is making a notation, an emendation, that this would have been until the time that Eli had died, which was toward the end of the judges, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and then the final verse is, and they set up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Yeah. So would that be a second witness and in a manner of speaking, a doubling to what was being said before? Mm-hmm. 
And to your point. Mm -hmm. Initially, I was asking if, if this with the captivity of the land would have been when Manasseh the king was taken captive. No. Okay. No, this has to refer to the period in the period of the judges when this book was written. So as we as we look at this one last time, they called the city the name of the city Dan. Nevertheless, which is the translation for how be it, the name of the city was Laish. So we have a name change, a false covenant. And we have a false form of worship. Because at no point in no way did our Heavenly Father sanctify the use of graven images mm -hmm. or of the unconsecrated as priests unto the Lord. So the graven image, the molten image, all of these things should not have been set up. Neither should the golden calf been set up at Bethel or at Dan, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, going back to where we were this last week, we were going through Judges 19. We have the story of the Levite and his concubine. The question that I ask at the end of last of the last session, what can we take from this where we have this certain Levite, which may well have been of the tribe of Judah? So we are talking possibly a false priest because he was of the tribe of Judah and not Levi. He has a concubine, which <clears throat> infers that he had a wife. He goes to retrieve his concubine. And as we come down in this, in this example, We have an old man that approaches him from his work out in the field. And this old man was from the area of Mount Ephraim, right? Mm -hmm. The old man opens his house. And acknowledges that they have room for the, for the Levite, room for the concubine, room for the servants, and they have both straw and provender for the asses. So... We came to this point last week where the men of Gibeah come banging on the door of the old man. And the men of Gibeah want just the Levite. They don't want the servant. The old man says to them, behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and the Levite's concubine. Them will I bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man, 
do not do the matter of this folly. We have in a same manner a similar story to what we saw occurring before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So my question was at that time, why the two asses? We know in the story of Balaam that Balaam rode upon his donkey. And we applied that to Islam, that Islam crushed Balaam's foot, that Islam turned out of the way, that it was Islam that spoke to Balaam as Balaam was about to attempt to retrieve, receive money from Balak to curse Israel. Here is a certain Levite from Bethlehem, from Judah, who has gone to retrieve his concubine, his wife with whom he has not really entered into covenant. He gave all the appearances, but none of the really the truth of entering in the covenant. And now the concubine is being offered up to men that didn't want a woman, but wanted relationship with another man. But the men would not hearken to him. Okay, so... Can we understand the symbolism here, what this, what it illustrates? Okay, good. Let's address it. Yeah. What are we well, saying? I don't know exactly. Well, okay, we have, we have one group within one tribe of the children of Israel. We have a small group within one of the tribes that is seeking to do exactly what was, was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Was the occurrence within Sodom and Gomorrah according to God's law? Obviously not. Okay. So this was this not accepting of the ways of the nations around them mm -hmm. so symbolically we have a church or a portion of the church that is choosing not to follow according to god's law mm -hmm or according to God's warnings. Would this be akin to those within the church that are choosing to purchase the writings of Ellen White and set them on a bookshelf, but never refer to them? Would this be akin to some within the church choosing not to follow the writings of Ellen White but to follow the ways of the world if it only agrees with if it doesn't agree with their theology then they put her aside right so in offering up his daughter a maiden and in offering up another man's concubine, what is the old man doing? What symbolism can we take from that? Hmm. 
we have a man giving that which is holy to the dogs in 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 a sense since one of them at least was a virgin well you know one of the one of the points that i looked at especially on that verse about not giving unto the dogs when we look back into into what the warnings were of moses moses combined that with not having a relationship with a prostitute i believe mm -hmm. if we look at this directly i don't believe that he is addressing the four-legged animal i believe that he is calling those that were of that were seeking homosexual relationships that he was calling them dogs mm -hmm. yeah i think it could have been a term for gentiles too like he heathen in general okay But again, but what it reminds me, sorry, Dwight, what it reminds me of also is when the Russians would go out on their sleds and they were pursued by wolves, they would sometimes toss people off those sleds to appease the wolves. Okay. Oh, so on birds, that's horrendous. Unfortunately, what is that not unlike the situation that Paul had when they had to lighten the ship? because they felt the ship was about to go down. Yeah, but they were throwing off objects. They weren't throwing off people. Although I hear, I read that the Romans wanted, wanted to kill the prisoners. Right. So in this situation, the old man is offering his daughter and the Levite's concubine. But does he bring his daughter out? Doesn't sound like it. As scripture says in Judges 19.25, but the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine. So the Levite took his concubine and brought her forth unto them and they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning and when the day began to spring they let her go their actions would not stand the light of day when it began to become light they chose to let the concubine go. Here, we have a certain Levite, likely the Levite that we've been addressing for the last several weeks. Mm -hmm. The man from Bethlehem, the man of the tribe of Judah. He is not standing up <coughs> to honor God or to honor scripture as he should have known it. He is doing nothing more than saving his own skin. Symbolically, what can we draw from that? Christ had plenty to say about hirelings that flee when the wolf pursues. And you can't appease wicked. You can't appease e evil. You have to resist it. And I mean, they could have called on God. He could have sent angels to defend them, just like he did in Lot's time. Well, I mean, the ones that, that the people of Sodom were calling for were angels. They were messengers of God, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, he could have 
The mob didn't know that. Okay, Lot didn't know that. That's fine. But should a Levite not have more reliance upon the word of God? Is, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, this this guy is doing nothing more than saving his own skin. He is not relying upon God. He is showing the baseness of his character. Agree. So we have a man that is truly nothing more than a hireling. He was hired by Micah. He was hired by the Danites. He has promoted false, false worship. <clears throat> and when the opportunity comes for him to be a stand-up person, He's not. Judges 19.26. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. What does this verse say to us? If he's opening the doors of the house, he is looking that the day is to begin, that he has nothing to hide. And he went out to go on his way. Does it say anywhere here that he goes to look for his concubine, that he's had any concern for her throughout this night? I'm taking it that this certain Levite went to bed. Yeah, that's the mental picture I'm picking up on. How callous can you get? How, how selfish and how callous can you get? Okay. I mean, the, the, the picture that we're given with Abraham when he's confronted with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's asking if how many righteous can be found, will you not destroy the city? He's asking and praying for their salvation. But we're not given this example with this certain Levite, with this hireling, this false priest. What should we take from this? Hmm. Can this be an example of the Sunday law? I think so. I guess the, the way I'm looking at it is this. We're going to have those within the church that are going to offer a peace and safety message. We don't need to worry about this. It's okay. The government knows what they're doing. We have a peace and safety message. Yet, the abuse is going on. Now when the day is broken, 
the Levite opens the door of the house that doesn't belong to him and went to go on his way. And behold, the woman his concubine was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, up, let us be going. But none answered. Now, if we take a look at the verses that are referred to here, or verse, we, we'll come to the chapter that we're going to be addressing here in a few moments. And they say, and the men of Gibeah arose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me. And my concubine they have forced, and she is dead. I would have to say again, here is a very callous situation. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces and sent her into all of the coasts of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it take advice, and speak your minds. So who is this certain Levite sending the portions of his concubine's body to? All of Israel, isn't it? Okay, it is. 12 pieces, 12 tribes. So that means that even the leaders of the tribe of Benjamin are receiving a, a, a piece of this woman's body, right? Right. What kind of message is coming here? First of, Sounds like they want he wants vengeance of some sort. Okay. How did he get the woman's body back to his house? Threw it up on an ass. So he put it upon Islam. Hmm. Can we say that we have a representation of a fallen church upon Islam? Hmm. It's not a stretch. So he is dependent upon Islam because we know that there are two asses. He has a servant that is with him. And he has his concubine's body upon an ass returning to his home. And as soon as he's come into his house, he takes the knife and divides his concubine. So why is it important that the body is carried by Islam? What can we see here? Hmm. Well, I have heard from a pretty reliable source that some of the students at Andrews were encouraged to pray to Allah 
since that was just another name for God? Well, I know from a situation from years past that Andrews University has a program to teach students to design prayer labyrinths. Did I hear you right? Labyrinths? Labyrinths. Yeah, okay, I heard you right. You heard me right. Now, it's shocking to me that at Andrews, they would choose to use these type of courses, that we must design prayer labyrinths to have people walk around a labyrinth or maze or a circle, however you want to say it. Yeah, it's a maze, basically. All right. With dead ends. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It's not that different from what was going on at Southern University when they are telling their students, the ones that look to become teachers and ministers and administrators within the church, that we want you to go into this room and pray to an idol in order to receive your degree. <laughs> Ironic. What are what is going on within the church that we are now accepting of situations like this and that we are choosing to follow the Jesuit teachings. So I, I just, I don't understand why the church is feeling that we need to accept spiritual formation. Yet that's what they have been doing since 2001, specifically since September of 2001. Well, you can't fix stupid. No, that's true. Now, here again, the verses that were given reference for Judges 19.29 we are told, Judges 20, verse 6, and I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. But we're also told to see Samuel eleven seven, because Saul took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out with one consent. Hmm. So, would we say that we have a righteous situation here or is this unrighteous when we compare this against what Saul did uh, are we comparing Saul's as being righteous then uh, the fake Levite as being unrighteous. Yes, no. As I, as I look at this, to be honest, yes, I do see what Saul did was correct because he was standing up for a city that was under siege and he was calling all Israel to the battle. I'm having to ask, I because here again, I'm not agreeing with what the false Levite did. 
this certain Levite. I don't agree with the taking of a concubine. I don't agree with sacrificing the concubine to save his own skin. But here he's calling all of Israel together to say a great sin has been performed in Israel. Is this different than what we have come to understand as Achan's sin? Because Achan took what was consecrated to the Lord. This certain Levite sacrificed a woman that saw him as her husband. She died at the hands of others. And now he's saying this is a lewdness in all of Israel. I see a false teacher um, trying to pepper, uh, perpetuate a false, a false, uh, religion at this point. Okay. I mean, the guys, the guys, a, a, a counterfeit Levite, right. And everybody should know this because of the lineage of this man. And they're listening to him like he's a priest. Right. Uh, Am I missing something here? <laughs> no, I think you. I, I think you've got it cited in fairly well. Should the situation in Gibeah have been allowed to continue? You mean with the Levite being the priest? No. Or with the um, the actions of the um, actions of those that lived there. Yeah, the guys that uh, perpetrated this crime. Well, a crime is all. The crime was a crime, and it was. But that I I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a judgment call. We're just trying to look at a story and trying to make the ends, trying to figure out what all this symbology means. Um, it's, <laughs> it's pressing my mind. <laughs> There's a lot of symbolic representations here. There's a lot of literal representations here. Mm. Literally. We have an example very similar to what happened in Sodom. Yeah, right. So wasn't Lot getting ready to offer up his girls too? Correct. Lot went and he offered his daughters, the two daughters that later came unto him. Mm. And so do you think at that moment that those guys went blind, that Lot figured out who exactly those guys were? I think that when the the men of Sodom went blind that Lot, Lot had an inkling as to whom he was entertaining. Yeah, I would think so. And, and because we have this thing as a historical documented event, um, we're looking, that, looking back at that in reference to the... Um, the Levite, the, the fake Levite. So the, the, the point that I'm making, it wasn't that long before when no. Moses told the children of Israel that if a man sought to lay with a man as he would with a woman, you are to stone them. Yep.
So this was a very direct admonition. It was a very in direct instruction. Here is a false Levite, a man of Judah, who sends the body of his concubine to all of Israel. He's shocking the nation. And now the nation wants to know why we are receiving the portions of this dead body. Because if this was to have occurred near the time of the Passover, anyone that came in contact with the dead body would be barred from the Passover. Mm. I'm not saying that's the time that it did occur. But there are admonitions about what was to happen with a corpse. And those admonitions should have been well known by this Levite. So he's... he's and re go ahead. Uh, regarding the blindness in Acts 13, it talks about Elamis, the, the sorcerer. Uh, Paul cursed him and made, and well, it was the Lord that caused this guy to be made blind. After Paul says, uh, You're full of all subtlety and mischief, a child of the devil, an enemy of all righteousness. That's a pretty fierce rebuke. And he says, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and darkness. So there you have spiritualism and well, darkness and blindness, it's pretty apparent what God thinks of turning to Satan, uh, trying to acquire the Lord's gifts to satanic means. Okay. And it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. Now, we go on to the next chapter. Hang on. Can you see that? Judges 20? Yes. Okay. Now, the children of Israel assemble at Mitzpah, before whom the Levite declareth his wrong. The resolution of the assembly to punish the Gibeathites. The Benjamites being required to deliver up the offenders instead of complying, make head against the other tribes. By the direction of God, Judah goeth up first against them, but the Israelites are repulsed at a great loss. They renew the fight the second day and again are defeated with a great slaughter. They seek to God with fasting and sacrifices and our promised success. They make use of a stratagem and destroy all the Benjamites with all that belong to them except 600 men and flee to the rock Rimon. We have quite a few verses that are referenced here. We're going to read this first verse and there are questions. Then all of the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba, with the, in the, excuse me, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mitzpah. Okay. 
What do we see here? What is important when it's saying that the congregation was gathered together as one man? They were all of the same mind. Can we say that they're united? Yeah. And this is occurring from Dan even to Beersheba. From judge to the well of the oath. From the judge to the 2520. <laughs> okay. What are we thinking there? Oh, I'm thinking of uh, 1 Kings 12, Jeroboam and his idols and Dan and Beersheba. Okay. Now, as, as I was looking at this with the different verses that the translators referenced, as we go through this, all of the children of Israel went out. We have Deuteronomy 13, verses 12 to 15. If thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently and behold, if it be truth and the thing be certain that such an abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. Right? Now, Judges 22, 11 to 13. And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the house of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of the Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go to war against them. And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and to the half-tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest. Judges 21.5, And the children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel that came not up with the congregation under the Lord? For they hath made a great oath concerning him, that came not up to the Lord to Mitzpah, saying, he shall surely be put to death. Now, the portion in Deuteronomy is very clear. You are to investigate. You are to inquire. You are to make search and ask diligently. You have an investigative situation prior to judgment. And behold, if it be truth that they have chosen to serve other gods, and if the thing is certain that such an abomination is wrought among you, you are to smite the inhabitants of that city. Who is to be smitten? Who was to be destroyed? Okay, it's, it's a simple question. I mean, is my internet having problems today? No, no. 
um, your question who was who uh, should be who is being destroyed at this point? According to Deuteronomy 13, who should have been? Who should have been destroyed? Dan. Would we agree that this certain Levite should have been destroyed? Would we agree that the Gibeathites should have been destroyed? Yeah. And in going forward, doing the investigation, those of Dan that set up Micah's images should have been destroyed. Absolutely. But we're being called together by someone that was a false Levite to go against the men of Gibeon. So what was the little admonition that we were talking about earlier um, that Israel, everybody did whatever they dang well pleased to do? That there was no king in Israel and every man did according to his own will. Right? Yeah, that's right. But they weren't following God's will. Not all of them were following God's will. Sorry. No, you're fine. So, again, we're given this, this example, as we referenced just a moment ago, from 1 Samuel 11. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard these tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out with one consent. All of Israel came together after receiving this strange message. All of Israel is typified by being from Dan even unto Beersheba. Dan is judge. Laish, the old lion. Even unto Beersheba. As we pointed out, being the well of the oath. So what is this illustrating exactly? Can you be more specific? Well, I'm seeing an illustration here of a part of those of Israel, a part of that of God that has gone away from the commandments that God gave through Moses. They know that morally is not to happen. So it's just an observation, but you know, it's just that one group that sucked in all Israel. You know, doing something that's not wanted, which is not destroying Dan, not destroying the Gibeonites, or they did destroy the Gibeonites. Or did they? Were they ever given to them? Well, we're, we're going to get into that in a few moments. Now, here we are. One city part of one tribe has chosen to not follow the word of God. We have also the example of Achan, right? Was Achan 
doing what God had commanded. No. So what happened with Achan? And what tribe did he belong to? Achan was of the tribe of Judah. This Levite was of the tribe of Judah. He came from, ben, from Bethlehem. Achan chose to take that that was dedicated to the treasury of the Lord. Wasn't Achan re reasoning in his mind that it was okay what he was going to do, what he did? In other words, he did according to his own will? Yes, he did according to his own will. I agree with that. What was this Levite doing? Did he not do also according to his own will to save him himself? No, I'm not sure. So now he's calling all of Egypt uh, or all of Israel together. As we come down through here, as the verse was finishing, then all the children of Israel went out and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mitzpah. What's Mitzpah? What's Mitzpah? Is the definition of mitzvah not a tower? Yeah, it's a tower. I, I know. Is it a tower? I believe it is. Okay. I know Migdal. I thought that was Migdal, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Migdal's a tower, not mitzvah. I'm trying to. this year oh, okay it's a watchtower yes so it is a watchtower yeah what's a watchtower you go to watch for um oncoming armies or enemies so in other words it's it's a way to watch to announce when the enemy is coming on them I would say so here we're being shown that the enemy was already among them because idolatry was among them sexual immorality was among them avoiding and ignoring the law of God was among them Yeah, and they also had a tendency of not inquiring of the Lord prior to making decisions. Exactly. I mean, and Joshua proved that one out and caused him to have a bunch of people that was carrying wood and carrying water for him. Yep, and we're, we're going to be seeing more about that this next week. Yeah. And the chief of all the people even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew the sword. That's a sizable army. Now, 
Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to the watchtower. Then said the children of Israel, tell us, how was this wickedness? What is that verse saying? What are we being asked to see here? The, the one group has gone up to a place where they can observe the watchtower, right? Right. And then they, what do they do? They ask them the question. But the verse reads, now the children of Benjamin heard. Does that not imply that the children of Benjamin did not join with the rest of the children of Israel? It appears that way. Yeah, I would have to agree. Are we not seeing then that we have an 11 and 1? <laughs> so then the children of Israel... Then said the children of, Is of Israel, tell us, how was this wickedness? And the man, the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. We have the man, the Levite, the husband of the woman. Three descriptions of the same person. What is important about seeing three descriptions? I mean, we know that a doubling is giving us reference to the second angel's message of Revelation 14. Here we have three descriptions. What are we seeing? And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine they have forced or they have humbled that she is dead. Is this man's testimony completely true? He's not including himself because he, he aided them to do that. He enabled it. Okay. And what were the actions taken uh, to make them think that they'd slain him? I didn't, I didn't pick up on that in the, uh, in the story. I didn't pick up on it either. So then I would, by that very uh, thought, um, I would say that that was a lie. If a man is willing to save his skin by the sacrifice of another, is he not willing to prevaricate his testimony as well? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. That would be a natural thing. I didn't do it, really, I didn't. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Now we know 
that Achan took what he should not have. We know that Achan took that which was committed to the treasury of the Lord. We know that Achan took garments that he felt were goodly, that represented his character. It was a covering. Here's a man giving a false representation of his character. He doesn't want to say, I gave up my concubine. He wants to place all of this strictly on the men of Gibeah. Now, were the men of Gibeah right to come to the old man's house to seek this relationship with this false Levite? I would have to say no. I would say that that definitely is a sin within Israel. But we also have a man that is sinned that's pointing the finger at Gibeah. Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and your counsel. Note, please. He is again pointing the finger to all of the other tribes assembled. He is not pointing the finger at Benjamin because Benjamin isn't there. Remember, they don't have correct information. What he said is not true, right? Right. So they're acting, they will be acting upon false information. Correct. But was it not incumbent upon Benjamin to investigate? Did we not re just read that from the book of Deuteronomy? Yeah, we did. And wasn't that those dudes that ended up fooling them and then becoming the wood, wood carriers and, uh, I mean, water carriers and the woodcutters? Well, <clears throat> when we're talking here, here you were talking about what we're going to get into this next week from the book of Judges. In the book of Deuteronomy, when the, and I'll, I'll go back to this. Deuteronomy 13 is before the children of Israel have crossed the Jordan. It is prior to the death of Moses. If thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently and behold, if it be truth and the thing be certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying mm -hmm. it utterly. So if the claim is made that the children of Gibeah have done this, that the men of Gibeah have done it. Should not the children of Benjamin investigated to see if the thing was true? Well, yes. Okay. So, if they determined that this was true, then those of the tribe of Benjamin should have done exactly what they were admonished to do. 
Gibeah, the men of Gibeah should have been destroyed. But that's not what happened. And all the people rose up as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, and neither will we any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do in to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. And we will take 10 men of an hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel and an hundred of a thousand and a thousand out of 10,000 to fetch victual for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin according to all of the folly that they have wrought in Israel. We're going to war. The men of Gibeah have done wrong. We are now going to war on the advice of one that serves idols. What does that say to us at this time? So who really was their leader then? Yeah, I agree. The point that I'm looking at is if they are calling this portion to war and it is to go against those that are serving idols, in this case, against Gibeah, they are walking in a fire of their own kindling. But it's being done at the advice of one that has served <laughs> idols. Is this any different from the church today <laughs> telling people what they ought to do to comply with the government. What do you think? Yeah, I can see uh, that too, Dwight. I think you need to repeat that question again, please. Okay. Here's the situation. We have a man that has been serving idols. He's worshiping idols, right? He's the certain Levite that was serving Micah and then was hired by Dan, right? Did we not cover that last week? Mm-hmm. He is coming and calling to war all of the children of Israel, all of God's children. He is a man that has been idolatrous. And he's calling all of Israel to go up against a city that has become self-serving. He's pointing the finger at others. So my question is right now, how is this different from a church that is telling its members to adhere to the mandates of a government? Not the laws, but the mandates. 
for we are to adhere to the laws. Are we to adhere to mandates? We shouldn't be. <clears throat> to be like an unrighteous unru decree. Exactly. So Israel comes up and is taking a remnant, a tenth, to fetch food for the people, to fetch food for the warriors, that they may come to Gibeah of Benjamin according to the folly that, ben, that Gibeah has wrought within Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, fellows together as if one man. Alternate verses that were being presented are now before you. I'll be back in just a second. Now. Ezekiel 37, 16. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, as they shall be one in mine hand. And Zechariah 10, 6. And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to the place to place them, for I have mercy upon them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am the Lord their God and will hear them. Why is it that the translators of this Bible are giving reference to these verses? What can we see here? Why is it important that Judges 2011? is showing us this unity. Showing us disunity or this? This, T-H-I-S. This, -I okay. I find it interesting because it's showing a time that all is, is going to come together. We've addressed in the past that these two sticks, especially with what was being shown in Ezekiel, is when our time, the movement, is going to come together as one, right? Mm -hmm. Well, specifically, though, this coming together, the joining of the two sticks is... Um, the joining of Sabbath keeping Adventists with Sabbath keeping non Adventists to stand at the Sunday law. Okay. So is this representation with this Levite and the slaying of the concubine another representation of the Sunday law? Yeah, I'm still not really understanding how to use this illustration. Um because I don't I don't I don't think it's talking about the Sunday law. Okay. What else are we seeing here?
Well, if if you go to the story of Achan, what you see is you, you see um, that one man's sin, or in this case, one city's sin, is is affecting the entire nation. Right. I would agree. And you have uh, a way in which it's going to be dealt with. In, in the story of Achan, which is under God's direction. I'm not so convinced that this is under God's direction in the story here in Judges. The, I guess the point that I'm trying to get at is that the tribe of Benjamin should have investigated the claim against Gibeah. Yeah. Was that not according to God's direction? Mm, that would be. So if Benjamin had investigated and determined that the thing was true, they were admonished that they should then take action. Yeah, and against the entire city. Right. Right. Because the city can't allow that to exist in its midst. The tribe cannot allow that to exist. And the tribe can't either. So, so this is spreading, spreading through the whole, whole nation. The whole nation is affected. And now the other tribes, they're going to address it once they find out about it. Right. So the point being... Benjamin should have addressed it, taken action, resolved the issue, but Benjamin didn't. Okay. So who does Benjamin represent? At this point, does Benjamin represent a conference or a union that is choosing to allow things to occur that are contrary to God's law. Yeah. See, I don't think, well, I'm not saying that that it can't apply there, but I still think that this applies to this movement, not to the church. Okay. Because this is the time when every man does what's right in his own eyes. This is uh, early writings, page 74. I was using this in a very broad sense. Yeah. So if this, if this is to apply with the movement, are we not at this point investigating different items that are being presented to see if they are in accordance either literally or prophetically with the, with the word of God. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing. We're studying. Right. Try to understand what's true and what's not true. So if we are studying and we're finding things that are not in accordance with the word of God, mm -hmm then we're finding that there are some within the movement that are presenting things that should not be, and then we have to, we have to take action, right? Yeah. Now, for different people, they're, gonna, they're going to see different, they're going to have different uh, evaluation of what, what's being taught that's error and how to address it. Right. Because there isn't agreement in the movement regarding what is what is truth and what isn't. So, so the question we would have to ask ourselves is who's following the example of this Levite? And how would we illustrate that? And then what does the woman, the concubine, represent? Okay. Okay. 
here we have a church, a woman representing a church, but one that has entered into, should we say, a, a false covenant? Mm -hmm. Right now, we have many within the church that take the words that Mrs. White wrote where she says that the church looks as if it will begin to fall. My it's, point, it is about to fall. It's about to fall. Yeah. And they believe that the church never falls, that it just goes on straight into the kingdom to come. And they apply that against the literal, the corporate church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when it appears to fall, it's because the corporate church does fall. Exactly. When so, it, when yes. it's yeah, when we think when we see the corporate church falling, we think that that's the fall of the church, but it's not. When the cor the corporate church falls, is that not a type of death? It's a disillusionment, isn't it? It can isn't be. That the, isn't that the technical term for it? Dis so you're saying the concubine would represent the church, but the I'm asking the question. Yeah. Well, it is in twelve pieces uh, uh, of the woman in the tribes, don't it? You know, it bothers me too when you say quotes like that to people in the church, then they have such a blase attitude, you know. Oh, the church is going to come through. Well, if God is pronouncing something like that against you, you think you'd want to correct the problems instead of remaining in this lay of the sea and attitude. Oh, well, who cares? Let's just continue as things are because God is going to pull us through. No, he isn't. Because you're pulling against them. It's just, I think this is more of a rebuke against this movement. It's not about the church. And, and the problem that I see here is that um, focused outwardly to, to the church as the problem. So if we apply well, this. Well, then, Theodore, we can say there's sin in both camps. Yeah, I know, and but it, the point is... Yeah. And it needs to be corrected in both camps. And I believe that people in this movement who are truly in this movement are going to accept the chastening and move on with God. The, the ones who don't are going to fall away. Yeah, my point is that when we focus upon the church as the problem, we don't see our problem. That is, it's easy. And, and, and the same, way it applies to other people. It's easy to see the faults of others, but not see our own faults. And so we need to be able to see what it is God's telling us about what we should do in what sin we are committing, what error we are making, in how we're evaluating God's word, and in how we're evaluating others. That to me would be uh, the point here. Um, that it's not so much to figure out what somebody else is doing that's wrong, but to figure out what we're doing that's wrong. So does the movement represent the Levite? <laughs> the Levite the movement? Sorry. Uh, why, why, why is that a laugh? Why did you laugh there? <laughs> well, I don't want to cry. Um, okay, well... Yeah, but it's not something that I would laugh over. But well, this is—I mean, you know—it's—it's—it's—it's it, it's, it's, it's true, though. I mean, you what you say—it's you know—it's about self-evaluation, and and it, and it should be about the movement. And oh, you you stopped talking. You're you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, since we are, it seems as though that we are the movement. Mm -hmm. Um. 
then it has to be a, a rebuke to us. If this is, we're thinking we're there and we're really not, we're, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not that close to it. I mean, you can see the difference uh, throughout the different uh, groups that are represented uh, and the wide variety of acceptance of certain things. Yeah, to me, it has to represent some aspect of this movement, something about this movement that we're unwilling to look at. Hmm. In that case, we need to be asking God to make us willing to look at it. And this is what I, I do, you know. Lord, please examine me. Help me to see where I'm failing you. And help me to correct it. Because I know I can't. Within myself, I can't. Well, I would say, you know, one of the things that, that the problem that this movement has, which, which it's always had, and which most independent ministries tend to have, is that they focus outward at the problems in the church. Um, and those problems are easy to see. I mean, it's not like they don't exist. Those problems exist. We, we end up producing uh, the same the same problems. That is, we do the same thing than as the church, sometimes worse. You know, so for instance, you know, we, we would often complain about how the church treats us in regard to censuring us in relationship to the 2520. But is this movement any worse in how it censures people who who have differing opinions or views or insights that we don't want to hear? Um, is, the, is this movement uh, full of gossip and rumors and backbiting? Um, and so when we try to criticize the church, but we're doing the same things, I don't see how that's, that's beneficial. And, and so somehow this movement has to stop doing what we see in others and change. It has to, it has to follow what what God has laid out for us. And, and that's, it, it's so easy to be self-justifying when you look at other people's sins. And, and that's the real problem here, as far as I can see in this story. It's, it's a rebuke to this movement. Romans 2, 2, huh? About being guilty of the things that we accuse others of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's something we have to we have to look at each of ourselves individually. Are we doing it? Because we can't. Because we could do the same problem within the movement. We could say, well, you know, this is talking about the movement, but it's not talking about me. Okay. I don't disagree. We have to be able to look at this. The, the disciples and those that were with them after Christ's ascension went into the upper room. They confessed their sins to one another. They prayed. There was self-introspection mm -hmm. before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The movement must have that same experience. Mm -hmm. If it, okay, I see we have a hand up. William, what do you have? Yeah, I was going to ask, what is it, what does them 12 pieces represent that he sent to the tribes? Okay. I'm asked to me. What's that? That sounds to me it's more like uh, us and the SDA church. When you got Benjamin and the other 11, sounds like the gathering of all of us. Okay. So you're saying that Benjamin represents this movement?
it represents a gathering. I don't know. Okay, because I mean, because we could say that the, I mean, and and that's where I'm trying to I'm having the problem trying to sort out this because we know the Gibeah is in Benjamin. And, and it is possible that Benjamin represents this movement. And and there's this call being made to the Adventist Church, let's say, which is all of Israel. Um, from this false Levite, whoever he represents. But we also have this woman who represents a church that has been mistreated and then cut up and her body parts sent to the various tribes. So, you know, in trying to interpret this, this story, I'm not really sure who's who. That's, that's where I'm having the problem. I mean, I can see the overall idea of the story, but then trying to, to take each of the, the players and say, well, this represents that. Um, it's hard to say. Well, well, I think that her hands being on the threshold must indicate something too, but I'm not sure what it is. Going back to, to William's question for just a second. When the children of Israel were instructed to seek to assemble, they were to do so with the blowing of trumpets, right? Because the trumpets were to advise them of war or they were to signal a, an assembly. So he cuts up the concubine into 12 pieces. He's not blowing a trumpet to assemble. He's choosing to send a, a very specific, very direct message to all of the tribes. But again, it's a, a situation that is, it, it has a shock value. We read the example from 1 Samuel. Because Saul cuts up his oxen and sends them out. How would you view it if all of a sudden you got a portion of an ox brought into your city or to your tribe? And that was my question, too. How did the people take that? Right. That's, that's why I'm seeing it being a, a shock situation. You think they would ask what sort of person would mutilate a corpse and send us part of it? And also I'm thinking of, of Hosea. God commanded him, him to marry a prostitute, but he cherished her and he tried to be faithful to her even when she was cheating on him. There's such a contrast here. Right. Okay, this is just a, a wild suggestion. I, I don't know if it has any merit whatsoever. So what if the movement, as, as we see today, is represented by this concubine, that it's been mistreated, and that it's, it's in a sense, been killed, and this false Levite is sending out these, this shock value to all of Israel, some kind of message to to the Adventist church to call them to, to deal with uh, the city of Gibeah. And the city of Gibeah would represent uh, as well at certain aspects of this movement or, or something. I don't know. It's just you've got all these different parts, um, the different players in this story. And there's a message going out to Israel to call to them together but it's on a false basis, or at least a misrepresented basis. 
and and then the part what part does benjamin have who's benjamin specifically is that something to do with this movement because you you know gibby is in benjamin uh so i don't know um, you mean son of my right hand and christ is at the right hand of god yeah well i don't know if that's necessarily going to apply here in this illustration i mean i don't see anyone here in this situation acting appropriately could I mean, the concubine be false doctrine well no it would represent a church a woman would represent a church in some some way What does it really say about um, those and, and their commitment to a covenant with the Lord? Yeah. He was calling them to. Well, this is all about covenants, but it, they're, not, they're not necessarily the covenants. This is in a time when every man does what's right in his own eyes. So it's, it's not a pretty situation no matter how you look at it. Well, I mean, no. it's still, <clears throat> go ahead. There's still a time when the there, even though every man does what's right in his own heart, he can choose to do and to follow the covenant that God is calling him to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. There's a contrast there. I saw, I was also thinking, what if people who used to be in this movement reneged against it for whatever reason and left? Some some calamity happens in their lives and then the mainstream church and others in this movement turn against each other because everybody's blaming everybody else for what had happened to these people that left us yeah well i think we still need to get through the rest of this chapter to really understand it i think we're going to have to yeah so <clears throat> Judges 20:12, And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that is done among you? Now, is this according to God's order? What, to, um, to, 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 to search this out? To send that the tribes of Israel sent men throughout mm -hmm. Benjamin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because this is following Deuteronomy chapter 13 and, and, and the next verse as well. Okay. Now, therefore, deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death, and I put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. So your point being that the movement could be represented by the concubine. This would then be the children of Israel standing up for the death of the concubine, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, they're shocked about what's happened. Right. So, I mean, the shock value here that the Levite has in sending out these parts, um, it's exposing some kind of sin that exists in Benjamin. Right. It needs to be addressed. So... Could be... I just don't know when this takes place because this would be the future from where we are now. Right. Hmm. Okay. 
So, <clears throat> they're making a search. They come to the, the children of Benjamin, the leaders of Benjamin, and they're saying, deliver to us the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. You have here 11 against one. Mm -hmm. Have we seen this in, other, in any other portion of scripture? The 11 against one. Well, the disciples. Okay. Mm. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities of Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at the time out of the cities, 20 and 6,000 men that drew the sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, who were numbered 700 chosen men. Yeah, so 26,700 altogether. Is there an importance to 26,700? What did I know of? 276, I know, was uh, from Acts 27, uh, 27, but 267, I don't know. Okay. Among all this people, there were 700 chosen men. Left-handed, everyone could sling stones at a hair's breadth and not miss. And the men of Israel, besides Benjamin, were numbered 400,000 men that drew the sword. These were men, all these were men of war. So you have the 26,700 plus 400,000. 426,700. That's a lot of soldiers. Yeah. It's symbolic. Uh, you have a 426. You have a 426 there. 26th day of the fourth. 26th day of the fourth month? Yeah, but regarding the 426. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, 1335 times 20 is 26,700. Really? Yeah. And our 1335 brings us to four, uh, 1843. Yeah. And and the 20 is, of course, the symbol from the, the giras, how many giras per shekel. So if this was, if this was not people, this was... Gira's, it'd be 1,335 shekels, which is 1,335, so. How do you do that? What's that? Oh, oh sh I, I didn't know I was <laughs> unmuted. I said, how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty good with math, but you just, the way you pull those things out and then it's incredible to me. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not idol worship. It's just, wow. Yeah. So here we are. We have 400,000 assembling against 26,700. we have a very large force against a very small force. Mm -hmm. 
they were going out by a lot. Which we will get into in a moment, yes. Or we may, because of the time, we may have to get into it this next week. All I'm saying is that the sheer numbers favor the children of Israel over the tribe of Benjamin. Now, given that we are at a point, we have about three minutes remaining in today's session. What else can we say, what else can we determine from what we're looking at here? I mean, this, this example of the 1335 is incredible. It's something for us to really sit down and think about. What else do we have here? What does 1335 represent? Well, when we look at, at Daniel, uh, Daniel 12, when we come, the, it is blessed is he that comes unto the 1,305 and 30th day. And we have usually seen this applied as being a representation of the year 1843. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So it is the year in which the Millerites came to understand initially that Christ was going to return, but was it not a time of preparation for 1844, for October 22nd, 1844? Hmm. So any other thoughts on this before we close? Yeah, um, brother Dwight, Dwayne, I mean, yes. Dwight, I'm sorry, I get your name mixed up. I'm sorry, not a problem. Uh, if this is symbolic, right, with the yes. with the woman being cut up and sent to the sale tribes, I don't know if this is being sarcastic or what, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, which one would get the head and which one would get the hands and the feet? Because if, if it's symbolic. You would send a head, wouldn't you send a head to a certain place and the feet and the arms to a certain place if he's trying to make a if he's trying to make a statement, right? Well, I don't see that we're told where the head or the arms or the feet went. I would assume. And this is my opinion only. And I cannot back it up that the head would have gone to Benjamin. Why would it go to Benjamin? I mean, the, the only other one that it could have gone to that it would have had any meaning would have been to Judah. That's what I was thinking. You know, yeah. he was head to Judah because it, Judah was the head of the tribe. Okay. Who okay. does Benjamin represent? Benjamin was the one that was going to be accused to be attacked because of what Gibeah did. But Benjamin at that point was their territory was also within that. I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to be. Uh... You were fine. Okay. I didn't see this as sarcastic at all. If 
game. But, you know, you'd send the head. Where would you send the feet, the hands? Like, you have 12 parts of the woman that you had to send to the 12 tribes. And they would, if it's symbolic, you would have to have them. You'd have to get have them to have meaning. They would have to have meaning for each one of the tribes, right? Or maybe I'm just overthinking it. Well, this is, hey, this is a thought that I have not spent a lot of time on because I can't back it up. It's just a question. It might have been a wrong question, but I thought I'd ask it. Sure. There's no such thing as a wrong question. Okay. Any other comments? Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, this is a very troubling lesson for us. There are many examples and there, there are many spiritual implications for what we are seeing here. Help us to consider this through this coming week. Please direct us, Father, guide us so that we might come to an understanding of what is being shown here. Not only for the time in which this happened, but in our time now. Guide us now. Direct us, please. Be with us as we worship through this day. Be with us with the study that is to come with Stephen. Show us that, Father, which we should know today. So that we may grow and be prepared in all that you would have us to understand. Thank you, Father, for these blessings. Be with us now. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.